Thank you. Thank you for leading us in music. Turn with me to Psalm 51. It's a beautiful portion of scripture. I was going to just use uh, verses 10 and 12 and verses 3 and 4. But after I reread it, it's, it's worthy of all 12 verses. It really is. And uh, I imagine the only thing missing in our Bibles is probably David's tears. Dripping as he wrote it. Because if you really look at it and think about the fact of what he was involved in, he's pleading. We read it, and there's been times I've had to go to it in tears of repentance. But then after you reread it, you can read it in tears of joy. Think about that. Because there's the There's the fact that we are flesh, and we need this from a gracious God that can wash us. And there's times where we've had to use this verse in our own lives. But then as we read it, we see what God can do, and that's giving us that forgiveness. Last time we covered this passage I think we probably went verse by verse. It might be marked in your Bibles. We went verse by verse. Let me reread this passage and then be thinking about the times that you've had to come to the Lord and ask for that cleansing. And then think about the parts of the passage where it says, you purify me, you wash me. And that's where the tears of joy should be coming from. Our Bible really should be stained with tears because of what God has done in our lives. Think of David. Mine says the contrite sinner's prayer for a pardon. He's truly asking for a pardon here because he's, he's done. He's done a great sin against God and against his fellow man and he's going before him pleading Verse 1, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the greatness of your compassion. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Here's the key, verse 3, for I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. And against you, you only, I have sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden parts you will make me know wisdom. Here's the blessing. Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I'll be whiter than snow. Make me to hear your joy and gladness. Let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God. Renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. Through prayer, confession, and admission, we can be restored. A clean heart, once again, a renewed, steadfast spirit within me. Restore to me joy. The 
the joy of my salvation and sustain me with a willing spirit. This morning, a heart of confession should be the Christian heart. A few weeks ago, I used a verse 28, 13 out of Proverbs. It says, he who hides their sin will not prosper, but he who confesses them will find compassion from God. And that's in this passage right here. So we're going to look at five things about God's restoring grace when we step into this passage and confess, admit, acknowledge, and then go to the one we know who forgives. There's five things we're going to look at. And God's love is unconditional. The second one is salvation isn't based on my performance. The third one is Jesus has already taken my punishment. Jesus, the fourth one is Jesus understands my human weakness. And the fifth one is God doesn't hold it on to grudges. He sets us free. And that free is something very important to us so that we can know our salvation is secure within our heart. One of the key verses that we, we always uh, read and go back to is 1 John 1, 9. It says, if we will confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I've got written, written here, unconfessed sins are like the weeds in our garden. Unconfessed sins are like the weeds in the garden. They steal the fresh water and they steal the nutrients of our life. And we are before the Lord and we are clean and pure. We are at our greatest that we can be for the Lord. Amen? Over the years, I've learned that relationships change. It doesn't matter whether it is a relationship with your spouse, your children, or friends. Relationships change. And this is also true in our relationship with God. Not on his side, but on our side. He is always the same. He is always there. And he is always there waiting. So no relationship ever stays the same. Relationships take work. Relationships take time. You either are growing closer to a person or you're growing or getting further away from a person. And the truth in that, it, it takes work. It takes a lot of effort. Now, I've used this phrase before. When it comes to understanding relationships, it goes like this. You can cross the same bridge a thousand times, but it's never the same water underneath it as you're crossing it. Things change, and it's our responsibility to check our hearts. Where are we at with the Lord? Are we close to him, or do we have something that stands between us that has changed the relationship? Or are we as, as close as we can be because we stay pure, we stay uh, close to him, and we go over our life like verse 3 says in verse 4, it says, For I know my transgressions. We all know our sins. We all know our sins. I can read scripture that says that you're a fool if you say you haven't sinned. Verse 3 says, For I know my transgressions, and my sin is ever before me. And then David acknowledges it. It's against you, God, when I have this against you. That is when my bones ache. That is when my heart hurts. But then he offers cleansing. And that cleansing washes us. And that cleansing is the pure blood of Christ that was shed for us. That we'll confess our sins. He is faithful and righteous to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We can be pure. We can stand in good relationship. Relationships get hot 
or they can get cold, you can get closer to a person, or you can get further away. And it's There's a lot of up days. Sometimes there's some down days. We, uh, we face temptations. Sometimes we win. Sometimes we fail. But we do have this thing that we can go before the Lord and get right. So we need to realize that we change the relationship. God's relationship to us is always right there. It's us that's either further away or close. David changed the pureness of his relationship, but he wanted it right again. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence. Do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me by your generous spirit. Verses 10 through 12. David knew, David knew within his heart he had to get right. I've been there. An unconfessed sin makes you want to walk away or stay hidden. But when we finally come to terms and admit our transgressions, we go before God and he welcomes us. He waits for us. He wants to restore us. Why is God so willing to take us back? How can we ask him to restore the joy of our salvation? How can he be so forgiving? He is a God of love and grace and restoration. So the first one we look at is we have to have a confessing heart because we know God's love is unconditional. He is faithful beyond our understanding. God doesn't say, oh, I'll love you if you are good, perfect, handsome, or holy. He doesn't say, I love you because you are intelligent, gorgeous, or gracious. He just says, I love you, and that's it. Period. Sometimes some of us need to repeat, repeat that little bit of phrase. It's not because of what I do. It's not because I'm super smart or, grac or gorgeous or gracious. He just says, I love you, and it's based on his love towards us. God will never stop loving you. God will never stop loving me because I am a recipient of his grace, his restoring grace. And here's the fact. God takes sinners and turns them into saints. He's a restorer. He's the restorer of my soul. He's the restorer of your soul. We've all should have admitted at one time we were in a jam. That we had some things that we needed to get right with God. God is in the life change business. He takes that which is dirty and he cleans it up. He takes that which is broken and he fixes it. I don't know about you, but I am thankful that God has worked in my life. Because I don't know where I'd be otherwise. And this is just who God is. He is the great potter. He takes a lump of clay and he turns it into beautiful vessels. And that's each, each one of you. Each one of you, for who you are right now, in your relationship, you're a beautiful person because of what God's done in your life. He's changed you. We need to be able to admit he has changed us, and it's through his hands. He knows exactly what he got when he picked you, when he picked me. He knows exactly what he got when he invited me to join his family. He knew what condition I was in when he chose me. The same with you. He knew the condition that you were in when he chose you. Here I am back in Lamentations again. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 22. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. We need to go to him. For his unending love, 
and his unending mercies. And if you got your Bible open, if you have your Bible with you, go ahead, circle the words never. Never ends. He is faithful. God's mercy never ceases. God does not reject believers when they sin because God is faithful even when we are not. Even when we have sin in our life, he's trying to coax us to him. He's trying to open our hearts. He's trying to soften us. He sends the Holy Spirit and he surrounds us, speaks into our hearts and says, this is not right right. Come to me and get right. And that's what David is saying. Draw me in. I need to see your grace. I need to see your mercy. I need to see your loving kindness. Your compassion. Verse 1, it says, blot out my transgressions. So his love is unconditional. The second one is because our salvation is not based on our performance. Our salvation is based on God's grace. It's on God's grace, not our goodness. I could never be good enough to earn God's forgiveness. But you hear everybody say, I think I've been good enough. I think I've been good enough. But the scriptures say totally different. It's God's goodness, not ours. Our salvation is based on God's grace. I could never be good enough to earn God's forgiveness. God offers forgiveness to me and he offers it to me freely. The Bible tells us that. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. We could really quiet down a lot of people if they just really read Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 and 9 because when you go out there and ask somebody on the street or at work and say you think you're going to heaven the first thing unless they're a Bible believing Christian they're going to say I think I've been good enough I hope I've been good enough and I even hear that sometimes from Christians if we just understood Ephesians 2 8 and 9 I will never work my way into heaven. The only way you ever have hope of getting into heaven is by God's grace. And it's freely given. You cannot earn it. You can't work your way to heaven. You can't buy your way to heaven. You can't bluff your way to heaven. There's a lot of people doing that. Bluffing their way to heaven. There's no other way into heaven that I read in the scriptures except through God's grace through his son, Jesus Christ. Tells us in Titus chapter 3, verses, verse 5, it says, He, God, saved us not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing and regeneration and renewal of the Holy Spirit. If you don't get into heaven on grace, the grace of Jesus Christ, I really got to say, you're not going to get there. It's through his grace. It's the only way God does this for us. Salvation is not based on performance. He's the one who has supplied it. And sometimes we go and we get dirty with something, and he still has something that cleanses us available. And it's called, for I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me, and against you, you only, I have sinned. It's called admission. Confession and admission. And when we get to that point, that is when God steps in and cleans us and purifies the heart. And David knew that. David knew he had to get to this point where he was knelt. I'm sure, I'm sure his writing of this was covered in tears. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 6, six Paul 
had listed off to the Corinthians the sins that they had been committing. They were of vile actions, thieves, drunkards, sexual sins, swindling. But because of Jesus, and because they were willing, if they were willing to confess, they could receive that cleansing still. 1 Corinthians 6.11, it says this, You have been washed and made holy, and you have received God's approval in the name of Lord Jesus and in the spirit of our God. And it was because they had to come to this point of confession and admission of what was going on in their life. My salvation is not based on my performance. It's based on the fact that Jesus saved me and that he shed the blood to cover my sins. And my salvation is that I believe and receive it and trust it and then live in a way that shows it. And that's what he calls us to do. Turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. Hold that too in 1 John because we're going to go to chapter 5 eventually. First John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. First John chapter 2 verses 1 and 2. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he himself is the propitiation, <clears throat> or the payment, or the one who stepped in, that's what propitiation means, for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. Salvation is offered to the whole world. The only way this salvation is not received is by rejection. Rejection of what Christ has done. Now go to chapter 5. And we'll read uh, verses 9 through 10. Chapter 5, verses 9 through 10, it says, If we receive the testimony of men... I think the testimony of men is work, earn, on my own. That would be the testimony of men. The testimony of God is greater. For the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. The one who believes in the son of God has the testimony in himself. The one who does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God has given concerning his son. And the testimony is this, that God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. And then verse 12, it says, he who has the Son has life, life eternal. He who does not have the Son does not have the life. It's nothing that we perform or do. It's what we admit and believe, our salvation. Jesus Christ fulfilled the requirement that was required for our sins with his precious blood. The third thing, Jesus has already taken the punishment. Hell was our punishment or eternal separation from God. If you are a believer in Christ, your sins have been dealt with. God does not ignore sin. God does not hide them. God does not sweep them under the rug. God sent Jesus to deal with them. That's all there is to it. Jesus came to pay our sin debt, and he paid it on the cross with his pure blood from his life that was sinless. He was pure and precious. Jesus paid the punishment for your sin because of the fact God does not reject you when you sin. Jesus has already taken that punishment for your sin. If you've accepted him as Savior, we can stay in that forgiveness mode by going and confessing. That's what 1 John says. 
2,000 years ago, Jesus stretched out his arms on the cross and took the punishment for my sin and your sin. He suffered for them all. He paid the price for every single sin you and I have committed. He took our conviction. He served our sentence. He was punished because I hate to put, uh, keep using you first, but you and me, that's proper, or you and I. He died for us. He gave his life for us. He humbled himself, and he took our punishment. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Someone had to suffer. Someone had to suffer. Someone had to die. Someone had to pay the price for you and I sin. And he died for us. It says in John 3.16, he died for the whole world. The salvation is offered to the whole world. But not the whole world is going to receive it because there are rejectors of this. And what sin did he die for? All of them. The ones I've committed, the ones that you've committed, the ones I will commit, the ones that you will commit. He died for all of them. The sins you've done in your past and the sins that you're going to commit. Jesus took the punishment for them all. And because of this, God does not reject you or I. He does not reject us. He accepts us because of what Jesus has done. Our sin has been paid for. Jesus cried out on the cross. And this is why he cried it out. It is finished. The punishment has been accomplished. It's over. It's done. It's finished. God's restoring grace is upon you, upon me, upon you, and upon me. And it's available to us. When we admit that we need it because we have sinned and then we confess that and believe and walk in his ways. Sometimes I slip. I slip off the path that God has for me. He picks me up. He restores me and he does the same for you. He tells us in the scriptures and he loves me with an unending love. It's for eternity. The fourth thing is because Jesus understands my human weakness. He knows we're flesh until this life here is over. Our flesh affects us. It wants to take over our, our hearts. We're tempted. But Jesus is sympathetic. He knows my frailties. He knows our faults. He knows what makes me tick and move and motivates me. He knows how I'm wired. He understands me through and through. He knows me. He knows me. There's a song that says that, right? He knows me. He does. He truly knows us individually. And so Hebrews chapter 4, verse 15, is what this is based on. We do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weakness, but one who has been tested in every way as we are, yet without sin. The truth of the matter is Jesus became human. I don't know how that all worked. Human, but yet God. Still God. In order that he could sympathize with our humanness and understand us. John chapter 1, verse 1. I'm going to put two of them together here. Let's go to John. John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God explains down through and then verse 14 
It says the word became flesh, dwelled among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. He dwelt among us. We sing a song, Emmanuel, means God with us. Out of Isaiah, trying to back all these statements with scripture. Isaiah, I think it's 714. Jesus cried out on that cross because he understood what we were going through. He understands our weakness. He became flesh, dwelled among us. And one of the most beautiful truths you're gonna, going to need to learn in the Christian life is God understands who we are. He truly understands who we are because he became flesh like us and faced what we face as humans. He knows our weaknesses. He knows our thoughts and the things that we go through in our mind. He knows our temptations. He knows our dealings because he lived just like one of us. Yet he did not sin. He was not tempted in any way to follow through in temptation. When Jesus was here on earth, he experienced every temptation known to humans. He says, I understand it all. I have stood where you stand. I understand what it's like to be a human being because I lived as a human being. For 33 years, he, he understands my weakness. He understands your weakness. He knows what you're going through. And he knows what it's like to be tempted. And we can read that in the scriptures. And then he offers us something when we do fail in our temptations. It's called admission and confession. Admission and confession. That's all he wants from us. Just like the scripture says in verse 3. I know my transgressions. And my sin is ever before me. And this admission we need to make. In verse 4. Against you... You only, I have sinned. And when David come to that point, a pure, white, fresh feeling came over his life. He was restored. He was brought back to a wholeness. And that's why we really should have tears on these pages, ourselves, just like David, I'm sure, had. The fifth thing is, and I'm glad of this, because God does not hold grudges. If you'll accept Jesus as Savior, he promised he will not hold grudges against your past. And that is something that we do not sometimes experience in the human race. Many of us have held grudges against people. How can I say that? Because there are some I've held grudges against. And I've heard other people say they've held grudges against people for years. And for years. And I can probably even give you examples within my own family. But the scripture that backs that Psalm 103, 12, it says, As far as the east from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. He is not going to go back to a sin and use it against us. If we've confessed it, admitted it, and asked for forgiveness, he is not going to bring it back up and hold it against us. I've fought amongst my own siblings, and usually what happens is the first thing... <laughs> That is brought up is something I've done in my past that bothered or hurt that person, even though it was settled. And I've done the same thing. Remember? God is in the perfect forgiveness business. As far as the east from the west, God removes our sins from us. When God forgives us, he forgives us completely. 
I remember my sins. You may remember your sins. They haunt us at times. We really shouldn't let them other than that we've gotten wisdom from them. But when God forgives, he treats me as though I've never sinned. Now there is a gift from God. He is not going to bring it back up and write it down and say, well, yeah, but let's go back here, here, and here. It says he casts them as far to the east as from the west, and he has removed them. He treats me as though I have never sinned as far as the east from the west. So far he removed my transgressions from me that he does not even take a glimpse. It is not in his character. That is grace. God forgives all my sins and heals all my diseases or sin. He redeems me from death and crowns me with love and tender mercies. He fills my life with good things. My youth is renewed like eagles. The Lord gives righteousness and justice to all who are treated unfairly. He revealed his character to Moses and his deeds to the people of Israel. The Lord is compassionate and merciful, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. He will not constantly accuse us nor remain angry forever. He does not punish us for all our sins. He does not deal harshly with us as we deserve for his unfailing love towards us, towards those who fear him, is great, as high as the heavens above the earth. He has removed our sins as far from us as the east is to the west. Psalms 103, verses 3 through 12. That, that is a blessing. God's character is different than ours. And we don't understand it. He is full of grace and mercy. And I don't think we understand what that really, truly means. Sometimes we get a glimpse. Peter at one time came up to Jesus and asked him, Master, how many times do I have to forgive my brother or sister who hurts me? Should I forgive them seven times? And Jesus replied, Seven times, hardly. Try 70 times seven. Infinitely. If Jesus instructed Peter to forgive over and over again, don't you think that Jesus will forgive us over and over and over again also when we fail? The forgiveness of God is displayed through that life of Christ that we have witness of in the scriptures. Even when Jesus was being put on the cross, as nails were being pierced through his wrists, hands, his words were, Father, forgive them. When we let God down, he forgives us over and over. God is forgiving. And we should continuously thank him for it. There's a verse in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 22. It says, come back, you rebellious people, and I'll forgive you for being unfaithful. And that's exactly what God did with us and also the people of Israel. I'll just finish with this. This is God's restoring grace. He takes me back. He cleans me up because he loves me and he loves you. God's love is unconditional. My sins have been paid for, and God does not hold grudges. But he shows great love towards us. Even when we still sin, he's there waiting. We change. And then we turn back. We admit. We confess. And then we turn away from what we've done. It's called repentance. And never do that again. And he 
he shows us a great love because he's full of mercy and grace. He's a God of unconditional love. Amen? Our God loves us unconditionally. He doesn't love us for our performance. The third one, our Savior. God took care of our debt, punishment. Our God and Savior understands our needs, and he does not hold grudges. That is a lot of good news in 35 minutes. Amen? Amen. And it should make us want to live for our Savior. True? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I pray that every heart here truly understands this passage. There is so much power in this passage. Power to forgive our failures. The things that we do against you. The things that we get ourselves into. The greatest of sins. And the only sin that's not forgivable is the one of rejecting you. Lord, I pray each person here has received you into their heart, called on your name, and know that you are faithful to forgive. I pray that they have accepted your salvation, what you did on that cross, shed that pure blood to show you paid for our punishment. And then you call us to live in your ways and follow through with the gift that you've given us, salvation. Lord, I pray that every person has dealt in their heart with who they trust in. I put my trust in you. And I pray that they put their trust in you also. And receive the greatest love of all, your love. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who died for us and paid our penalties. We thank you for this time that we can share in your word, the powerful word that even forgives the greatest of sin. In Jesus' name.